These would have to come up from the west, from over the Mediterranean Sea. The servant went up six different times, came back and said not a thing, perfectly clear sky. Each time Elijah sent him back, go on up and watch. And the seventh time he came back and he said, I see just one little cloud, looks about the size of a man's hand. So Elijah went to Ahab, who'd been dawdling around. He never did have resolution enough to get busy and do anything, and he was still standing around. And Elijah urged Ahab to ride fast to the town of Jezreel, or the storm would cut him off. So Ahab and his chariot whipped the horses and started back for Jezreel, and Elijah ran the whole distance ahead of Ahab's chariot. Now when he was by himself, Ahab, who never had a good thought or impulse in his life, at least weakling though he was, could be persuaded to take these steps. And when he saw the results that came of them, he was impressed. So he went home and told Jezebel, and there was a regular volcanic eruption in the palace when he told Jezebel about this, because she wasn't the weakling that he was, although they were equally evil. She sent word to Elijah. She said, may the gods do so to me and more also, if I haven't made your life like one of these prophets of mine by this time tomorrow. And she meant it. And remember, she was boss. She could send the army out after him. So it was time for Elijah to move on again, to flee for his life. Now remember, during the three years, they were trying to get hold of Elijah to murder him. Because the drought had come, as he had said, there shall be no rain or dew these three years except as I give the word. So, every neighboring kingdom received messengers saying, Is Elijah in your kingdom? If he is, hand him over to us, or we'll make war on you. Well, Elijah fled first to Beersheba in the extreme south of the kingdom of Judah. But he knew that even there he wasn't safe from Jezebel's vengeance. So we went out into the desert and lay down under a bush, and he was ready to give up. He said, Lord, I alone am left of thy prophets, and they are seeking my life. I am not better than my father's now. Let me die. But he went to sleep, and during the night an angel woke him up, and there beside him the angel had placed food and drink. And Elijah ate and drank and went back to sleep. And a bit later that night the angel woke him up again, and again beside him the angel had placed food and drink, which Elijah used. Now, beginning the next day, Elijah made a journey of 40 days on foot, all on that same food and drink, to Mount Horeb. That was the mountain on which Aaron died during the Exodus. To this day, the Arabs call it Jebel Harun, the Mount of Aaron. It's in the mountains of Edom, close to Petra. So, on this desolate, rocky mountain, Elijah finally found a cave and went in and sat down. And then he got a demonstration of what God's power really is. That it's exercised usually in other than spectacular ways. There was a terrible windstorm 
Then there was an earthquake, and after that a fire. But Yahweh was not in any of these. Then it says a still, small voice spoke to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, They have killed all thy prophets but me, and they seek my life. Well, that's all that was left to do the will of God. But God found it sufficient. He didn't need big armies. So Yahweh commanded Elijah to go back. And he gave him three specific projects to do, though as a matter of fact, Elijah only completed one of them, and his successor, Elisha, completed the other two. God told him, go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, which he did not do. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, which also he didn't do. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy place. And that one he did. Elisha, Elisha, God is salvation, was out plowing in the field on his father's farm. Elijah walked by him and cast his cloak or mantle over the shoulders of Elisha. Well, the meaning of that was well known in those days. I am putting my power upon you so that you will be with me as my assistant or understudy and eventually my successor. So, Elisha, first offering up a sacrifice, followed him. Now you remember when the people of Israel were on the march, and just before they entered the Promised Land, God gave them very clear and specific instructions. He said, the people who are now living in this land, these various Canaanite peoples, you are to exterminate absolutely. You are not to leave one person, man, woman, or child, alive of them. So you aren't going to have integration. Now as to the other nations who are outside the land that I am giving you, don't you make aggressive war upon them. But if they attack you, you give them a lesson that's going to last for generations. In fact, if need be, you just proceed to kill off the whole male population, which will reduce their warlike qualities quite noticeably. Well, you can say one thing about our people. We have one virtue, if you may call it that, and that is consistency. We never fail to violate God's instructions. And that's what they did. And Ahab was no exception to the rule. Now he had been twice attacked by Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. And twice with the armies of Israel, he defeated Ben-Hadad. And the second time, he captured him. And Ben-Hadad expected the fate that normally befell the loser in that sort of a battle, that he'd have his head lopped off. Instead of which, Ahab spared him and made an alliance with him. Well, for that, Yahweh gave judgment that the disaster which Yahweh had intended to bring upon Syria and Ben-Hadad would in punishment come instead upon Ahab and Israel. And if you want a parallel in our own generation, 
What about Mr. Nixon's sellout to China and Russia? The more it changes, the more it is the same. We do the same evil things for the same wicked motives, and then we're surprised when we get the same judgments. Well, Ahab's wickedness wasn't entirely over yet. Near Ahab's palace lived a man named Naboth, who had a vineyard there. And Ahab wanted it to add it to his palace grounds. But Naboth refused to sell. Remember, under the laws of God, you could not permanently sell the family homestead. You were only authorized to sell temporarily under sheer necessity. You got in debt so that the only thing you could do to raise the money to pay off your debts was to sell the family homestead. But remember, you could only sell it until the next year of Jubilee, which couldn't be more than 50 years away and might perhaps be next year. Well, Naboth was, for some odd reason, in the kingdom of Israel, a man loyal to Yahweh and believing in obeying his laws, so he refused to sell. So, like a spoiled child, Ahab went home and was sulking around the palace, and Jezebel noticed that he was out of sorts and asked what the trouble was, and he said, well, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. She said, are you king in Israel? I'll get it for you. So she set up a scheme. She sent word out <coughs> to some corrupt people to set up a neighborhood celebration, a big banquet, to which Naboth would be invited. And a couple of hired perjurers were to be there to accuse Naboth of blasphemy against God and the king. And for this, they were to stone him to death, which they did. So, with this done, Ahab went out and seized the vineyard. Now, of course, as far as the law of God was concerned, not only was he guilty of murder, but he had no more right to seize the vineyard now because it should have gone to the heirs of Naboth. Well, this was sort of a last straw, and God commanded Elijah to pass judgment on Ahab for this. It's 1 Kings 21, verses 17 to 23. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith Yahweh, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? Thus saith Yahweh, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of Yahweh. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity and I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spoke Yahweh, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of the city of Jezreel. Well, Jezebel wasn't at his elbow at the moment, so Ahab was quite impressed by this. He was so frightened by this warning that he changed from his royal robes into sackcloth as a sign of mourning and contrition, and he conducted himself very carefully after that for a while. So God spoke to Elijah about this, 1 Kings 21, verses 27 to 29. And the word of Yahweh came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, 
I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. Now that didn't mean that Ahab was completely forgiven and was going to get away with it. But you remember before the death of Solomon, because he was so wicked in his later years, God said, I'm going to tear ten-twelfths of the kingdom out of his hand. But he said, nevertheless, for David his father's sake, I won't do this in Solomon's days. It will be done in his son's days. So you have a similar thing here. The destruction that was to come was postponed from Ahab's day until his son's time. Why? Well, Ahab had indicated some repentance, probably not sincerely, but at least the outward show of it. He'd been threatened with punishment. Now he shows repentance, and then the punishment comes anyway, just the same. What's the moral of everybody drawing? Why repent? What good does it do? Because you have the trouble anyway. Now it is to prevent people from getting that sort of an idea that God said, now this situation here in the kingdom of Israel is too bad to be allowed to go along. But because Ahab is showing repentance, I will postpone the judgment. Well, Elijah's prophecies concerning Ahab and Jezebel all came true. See 1 Kings 22, verses 1 to 38, and 2 Kings 9, verses 1 to 37. Ahab himself went out to make war again. His former enemy and recent ally, the king of Syria, made war on him again. Kings in those days didn't stay home hiding in the palace cellar. They had to lead their troops into battle, or somebody who could lead them into battle soon became king in their place. And as Ahab was leading his troops into battle, one of the enemy archers drove an arrow through him. It hit from the joint in his armor. So desperately wounded, he told his chariot driver, take me out of the battle, take me home. So they got him back home. He died on the way, bleeding all over the chariot. And they took the chariot down to a pool of water to wash it, which was right where Naboth had been stoned to death and the dogs were licking Ahab's blood off the chariot, right where they had licked up the blood of a murdered Naboth. Well, the other part of it is a long story in itself, so I'll make it short. Neither of these things happened in Elijah's time, but in the time of his successor, Elisha. Elisha anointed Jehu to be king. Well, after all, that was about as good a job as you could get in those days, and Jehu was quite ready to take it. He was quite a popular army officer, and uh, when the other officers heard of this, why, they flocked to his support with the troops. So Jehu started out for the city of Jezreel, where Jezebel was at that time. He took the city, and... Uh, as he came in, the head of his troops, Jezebel, in the upper story of the palace, leaned out the window to make some sarcastic remarks at him. Somebody said that uh, etiquette indicates that you shouldn't insult the hangman while you're mounting the scaffold, because he can adjust the knot so the rope hurts more. And that was the sort of advice which Jezebel should have had. Jehu wasn't taking much of that from Jezebel. Some of the servants were looking out the upper story 
windows too. So GU said, who's on my side? So some of them indicated they were, and they threw Jezebel out the third story window, which caused uh, the results you might imagine. <laughs> well, GU and his troops went in, took over the city, made sure that he had the administration securely in his hands. And then he said, oh, yes, there's Jezebel's corpse out there. Somebody go bury her. But by the time they got there, her skull and her hands were all that were left. The rest of her body had been eaten by the dogs. So just as God had prophesied through Elijah, the dogs ate Jezebel. This happened, though, as I say, under Elijah's successor, Elisha. For a time, Elisha followed with Elijah as sort of understudy, as you might say. Now, when God had told Elijah, you go anoint Elisha to be your successor, that was telling him, well, you're not going to be around very long yourself. Finally, Somehow the word came to Elijah, you are about at the end of your life now. And he didn't know exactly how it was to be, but he wanted to be alone. Perhaps he had been told that he was going to be translated without going through the experience of death. But he tried to be alone for it. First he told Elisha, you wait at Gilgal here while I go on to Bethel. I have to go there. Elisha said, no, I won't leave you. So they both went to Bethel. Then Elijah said, well, you wait here at Bethel because I have to go on to Jericho. Elisha said, no, I'm not going to leave you. They went to Jericho. And again, Elijah said, you wait here. I've got to go out into the desert across the Jordan. And Elisha said, no, wherever you go, I'm going. <coughs> well, here was the flowing river to cross. Now, you remember that the river was stopped for a time when the people of Israel were to cross the Jordan to enter the Promised Land. Elijah got the same results. He rolled up his mantle, his cloak, and struck the water with it, and the flow stopped, and soon there was the dry stream bed that they could walk across on, and then the flow of the river resumed. Well, they both knew, of course, that this was to be the end of Elijah's career. And Elisha said, I want a double portion of the spirit that is upon you. Now that is something easy to misunderstand, and at one time I misunderstood it myself. I thought Elisha was saying, I want twice as much of the spirit of God as you have. But that wasn't it. Remember how the property was divided upon death? The oldest son received a double portion. If there were four sons, for example, the property was divided into fifths. The oldest son got two-fifths, and each of the other three got one-fifth apiece. So Elisha was saying, I want a portion showing that I am your heir and successor. Elijah said, well, I don't know whether I can give you that or not. In other words, that's up to God. He said, if you see me as I am taken, it will mean you have your request. If you do not see me as I leave, then you do not receive it. Well, there suddenly appeared a chariot and horses of fire. Again, the 
atomic fire of God, the terrific energy that shows itself in this tremendous radiance. And it came between Elijah and Elisha, caught up Elijah, took him up upward into the sky, and vanished. So that ended the career of a great prophet. Now a brief career, possibly five or six years at the outside, a man who left no writing, but a man who did a job at a time when philosophical discussions were not needed as much as doing something about it. And you remember that in the book of Malachi, God says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. This again is the time when philosophical discussions don't seem to produce much result. And it's going to be time for the man who has both the courage and the ability to do something about it. Now, we were told, of course, that John the Baptist was a partial fulfillment of that. It said he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. It didn't say he was Elijah. And God doesn't say, I will send you somebody else, but with similar power to what I gave Elijah. He said, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Well, now we know that that day hasn't yet come, but we know that it's awfully near. So Elijah, the man we've been talking about, is someone we might meet in the near future. And I thought you ought to know something about him. My subject today is God Give Us Men. It has been said that history repeats itself. And in explanation of this, it has been said that those who will not learn the lessons of history are condemned to relive it. Over the centuries, we have gone through this dismal and bloody process many times. And only by the mercy of God have we been saved out of the dangers incurred by our own stubbornness and stupidity. We are again in a time of deadly peril where only men of courage and faith can lead us. It is a time when men of little faith think that we must compromise with evil, abandon our principles, accept much of evil in the hope that this will postpone the time when we must accept all of evil. We have witnessed the sorry spectacle of two political parties competing to see which could sell out its honor the cheapest in order to buy minority group votes at the expense of the majority. But all history clearly demonstrates that compromise with evil never brought anything but more evil. Nations are not saved by cowards or weaklings, but only by those with the courage to follow where God leads. There was a similar time 28 centuries ago when the same faults brought the same dangers to our ancestors. About 925 B.C., Ahab and his wife Jezebel came to the throne of the kingdom of Israel. Ahab and Jezebel brought in the priests of Baal. In the deadly parallel, in our own times, Roosevelt declared that many of his best friends were communists and he put them in places of power in our government. Ahab pandered to the idolaters for popularity and support. Roosevelt pandered to the Reds and fellow travelers for the same reason. Ahab and Jezebel mercilessly hounded all the prophets of the one true God. Roosevelt mercilessly hounded the patriotic Americans who tried to prevent our corrupt betrayal to the Reds. In ancient days, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, made war on Israel. God told Ahab, I have given him into thy hands. But Ahab spared him and said, Ben-Hadad, my brother, and made a peace treaty with him. For this, God told Ahab that the penalty was disaster for the nation and death for himself. 
In our own time, Joe Stalin made Cold War on all the civilized world. But when Germany renounced any claim on Western European territory and asked only to be let alone while she threw back the Asiatic red hordes menacing her eastern borders, Roosevelt came to the aid of Russia and made agreements with Stalin which has now brought us to the brink of atomic war for our very existence, war which will be disastrous even if we win it. And death struck down Roosevelt when he was alone with two Russians. Into the ancient scene of confusion and peril came the prophet Elijah with the warning of God's wrath that compromise with evil always brings its penalty. The reaction of Ahab and Jezebel was not repentance, but raging hatred. Elijah had to flee for his life. Today, as then, the reaction of the wicked in high places is merciless hatred, the attempt to destroy those who bring God's warning, lying smear campaigns against every outstanding American patriot, perjured frame-ups to put them out of the way before they can upset political dynasties. But how they love to call us hate mongers. When Elijah returned, King Ahab said, So you are the man who is troubling Israel. Ahab meant, I had the people just about persuaded to follow me deep into the ways of evil. And then you came along and stirred up suspicion and discord. Today, that is what all the leaders of evil say about us, that we stir up discord and prevent unity in evil. But Elijah brought a challenge. Let us see which God can answer prayer by fire. He did not say, let's see which corrupt betrayal of a nation will most certainly gain the support of minority groups. Here was no compromise, no evasion of responsibility, no fear of the opposition of the wicked. Here was unflinching dedication to God's truth. You know what happened. God answered Elijah's prayer. Fire from heaven lighted the altar, and the people then understood who was right. Elijah cleansed the land by slaying the 450 priests of Baal. Elijah wrote no book left no message for the future, but he served God without retreat or compromise. Others talked more, but he dared to do what others only spoke. God has accounted him so much the greatest of the prophets that it is Elijah, not Moses, Daniel, Isaiah, or Jeremiah, but Elijah, who has chosen to return in our day. In the book of Malachi, God promised, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There was a partial fulfillment of this in John the Baptist, for we are told in Luke 1 verse 17 that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But this was not the great fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy, for it was not Elijah himself. Though John had the spirit and power of Elijah, yet Elijah's companion, Elisha, had a double portion of that spirit. John's partial fulfillment was to make ready a people prepared for the Lord at his first coming, but that was nowhere near the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord is very near, and again there is need of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord at his second coming, when he comes to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords forever. How can we face the return of our God when most of our leaders are again wondering whether 30 pieces of silver aren't worth more, after all, than loyalty to him? How can we say we are seeking first the kingdom of God when right and justice are trampled underfoot in the scramble to seize the supposed rewards of expediency, when we are still ruled by the same evil cliques who, for their own sinister purposes, sold our brothers of Eastern Europe into slavery to Asiatic communism, and who today conspire to betray Formosa, Germany, and France, ostensibly to gain the goodwill of Mao Tse Tung and Nasser, of Sukarno and Brezhnev. How can we invite our God to come for any purpose but judgment upon us? 
before he comes, we must again have Elijah cleanse the land. We need many Elijahs. Elijah had courage. There were arrayed against him all the great men of the land, but he was not silent for fear of offending them. Elijah was not afraid of the smear treatment, even from the king himself, but he boldly exposed the wickedness in high places which threatened the nation's existence. Elijah fought corruption in high places. Today, who dares expose treason even in the other political party? Elijah didn't think we needed unity and harmony with evil. He saw that only destruction can come of that. Elijah didn't pussyfoot and use mealy-mouthed evasions to avoid offending those who can't stand the plain truth plainly spoken. He warned of the disastrous consequences of all appeasement of evil, even though it brought him the bitter hatred not only of the leaders of wickedness, but also of the lazy masses who just didn't want to be disturbed. His following was small, only 7,000 men, but these were enough to restore the nation. Can't we find 7,000 honest men today? The Bible has told us what to do in times such as these. Isaiah 58 verse 1 gives the first instruction. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. The prophet Amos, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, gives us hope. Hate the evil, and love the good, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. And Paul promises us triumph in Philippians 1, verse 28. Never be scared for a second by your opponents. Your fearlessness is a clear omen of ruin for them and of your own salvation at the hands of God. Today we know with certainty that the great and terrible day of the Lord is almost here the final conflict in which all the world, nations and individuals alike, will be forced to get off the fence and take sides, either with good or with evil. The struggle is truly one of life or death. Never were the forces of evil more determined, more desperate, more vicious. When Elijah was carried up to heaven without experiencing death, his companion and successor, Elisha, picked up his mantle. Striking the waters of the river Jordan with it, he cried, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? We need not ask that. Today the question is rather, Where are the Elijahs of the Lord God? Send us the power, O God, that the land may be cleansed and a people prepared for the coming of the Lord God.